So, Brant, did you join us because you saw on the agenda we were going to talk about the floodplain bylaw? Yes, um, I did. So I'm sort of lurking for the early part of your agenda. Yeah, so we can deal with that now. Um, all I was going to do is update the uh, the commission on the things that we've talked about. And if you'd like to give an intro to what's going on, I'll let you have the floor. How about <laughs> I just served myself some dinner since I was going to lurk. So oh, why you're don't we just okay. follow your agenda? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I appreciate, but I'm happy to just sit and listen for a while. Okay. I'll, I'll have video and audio off. No problem. Um, but it, I, I will, I'll address it since we brought it up because we're just into the other business part of the meeting until seven ten. But you, I think you're probably all aware that, you know, for the last year or two. The town has been trying to develop a uh, floodplain overlay district bylaw that's required by state, which because it's required by the feds. If anybody wants to get fl FEMA flood insurance, I guess our, we have to have a bylaw uh, in place. Um, and in early drafts, uh, Peggy Sloan was helping the con uh, the planning board to draft it, and. They thought, well, since the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction over the floodplain, maybe we should require everybody to get approval from the Conservation Commission before uh, they can be okayed under the bylaw. Uh, so there's been lots of discussions, uh, lots of sort of churn, uh, a lot of questions we had to get answers to. And it was decided that um, it's if it's the planning board's bylaw, it wouldn't be appropriate for the commission to have an official role as the decider on permits, and that that should either be a, like a town administrator or the uh, the the zoning enforcement officer, which I guess would be FERCOG. Um, and so I I'm not quite sure where that's landed, uh, um, but. In terms of the role of the Conservation Commission, it still seemed like it would be important for the commission to be in the loop. And because we do review projects in floodplains, we may have more, you know, experience in, in evaluating these projects than the build, the building inspector's office or the town administrator. So we've been playing around with some language about how the commission might get involved. And the last, uh, the last bit I had proposed, and I think it's in the latest draft, which I still haven't reviewed, Brant, I'm sorry, it's on my list. Um, essentially, I took language from the Wetlands Protection Act where it talks about the role of natural heritage in evaluating rare species impacts. That basically it says that if somebody is proposing to work in an area where rare species have been uh, are estimated to occur based on the estimated habitat maps, then the application has to go to natural heritage and natural heritage has a certain amount of time to review it and to issue an opinion. And so basically they issue an opinion as to whether it's actual habitat and whether um, the, the project as proposed would have any adverse impacts. And then it's up to the Conservation Commission to take that opinion and make a decision. So essentially, the the uh, natural heritage program has an advisory role, but it says in the regulations that their opinion is presumed to be accurate and can then only be overcome by a clear showing to the contrary. And so I thought this might be a good model for how we include the Conservation Commission in the bylaw as having an advisory role, but with the presumption that our opinion is accurate and therefore, whoever is implementing, whoever is the floodplain manager, um, would essentially wait for our opinion and then take act on that opinion as if it was, you know, the opinion, the the um, the binding opinion under the bylaw. But so it's not us actually making the decision, but we're making recommendation, and the floodplain manager would then make the decision with the presumption that we know what we're doing. So I just thought I'd bring you up to speed on what I proposed in terms of our role in that process, so that if there's any concern about it or uh, any questions about it, this is a good time 
to sort of raise them, but also just to make sure you're informed about it and it doesn't catch you by surprise that we've got a new role in town uh, when and if this thing passes uh, a town meeting. So just Brandt, so will we have time a little later in the agenda to just talk about language or do you just want to, because I counter propose some new language maybe We'll just look at your original language, my counter, and see if we can make some progress tonight. Or how do you want to handle that? Yeah, I mean, we can come back to this and then talk about specific language. And uh, uh, in that way, you can get the input of the entire board. It, it's a very short paragraph in the bylaw. So it's not something that's probably going to take a lot of time. Um, other commissioners, are you open to that? Yeah, that's fine. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, okay. and, and I'd be happy to, this doesn't have to be a decision meeting about this, but mm -hmm. some, some feedback and then maybe Scott, when you get a chance to sort of sit with it and, you know, or maybe we'll, we'll just see how it goes. Mm -hmm. we, um, sure. and, and then I'll give you all a sense of what our ideal schedule is, which is not a, you know, a, we're not under a, a huge gun to get this done so we have some some time to deliberate okay, okay cool that sounds good um so why don't we go with the minutes next and then we'll continue with the sort of updates and other business um Montserrat had found a couple of typos that i have since corrected My in the first two bullets yeah, you're you're such a valuable member for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so basically, it was where I put uh, addition. It should say additional, mm -hmm. as in additional information is needed. Does anybody have any comments about the uh, uh, the minutes or any other corrections? None for me. No, looks oh. good. I made the mistake of like waiting almost an entire month before I wrote them up. So it was a little bit of a challenge to try to remember, you know, like who said what and where, where were we and what did I say, et cetera. But well, I'm impressed because I have to write minutes the next day if I take minutes. <laughs> I usually try to, but this one was just too big to get done and I kept putting it off. Um, all right. Well, if there are no corrections or other comments, then. Let's have a vote to accept the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Great. Thank you. All right. So we're now at 710. So we can now open the, the public hearing for the Haydenville Road project. So all in favor of opening the public hearing, reopening the public hearing? Aye. 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 And it, it appears that we do not have anybody representing the applicants in this because they are still working on the revisions and they need to meet with Mass DOT to discuss those revisions and that their request, uh, they would like us to continue the hearing until our next meeting, which would be November 20th. So I propose that we vote to continue the public hearing until November 20th at 7.10 a.m., giving us again a little bit of time for other business if we have people that have quick things that can get in and out before we get wrapped up in in a big review uh any questions or comments about that uh, p.m scott not a.m yeah oh p.m yeah. sorry <laughs> <laughs> that'd be interesting <laughs> see it's good i'm just keeping you guys on your toes you know you guys have got to pay attention here you never know what i might slip by uh when you're not looking uh, Look right. a i'm like did he say that? <laughs> yeah, I was doing the same thing. Yeah. It'll be 7 a.m. somewhere in the world, I know. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all in favor of continuing the public hearing? Aye. 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 All right, so some of the other topics that I just put on here are based on emails that came through this week. Uh, or, uh, you know, the, the first one is uh, the good news about the shared conservation agent. Uh, it's now official that uh, this woman, Kelly, and I can't remember her last name, uh, is going to begin next week. And so I will probably meet with her next week and we'll set up a schedule for training, uh, try to get her set up with a subscription to the MACCE handbook so that she's got some things to, to keep her busy while we five conservation commissions get ourselves organized. 
I will invite her to meet with us at our next meeting so that she can meet all of you, but also see what, what goes on at our meetings and how they run. Our complete disrespect for Robert's rules of order, uh, but strict adherence to open meeting law otherwise. Um, so it's it's good news. It's going to keep me busy for a while trying to bring her up to speed. Uh, to try to train her on the Wetlands Protection Act and other responsibilities, things like open meeting law. a great law. investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time. but in the long run, it's it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. Great. Um, can I just clarify one thing, Scott? Um, yeah. I, did, I read uh, there was a piece in the recorder about the shared conservation agent. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, and so it's my understanding that her salary is all set for the first year, but then we're going to have to vote on it at town meeting subsequent years. Right. And same with every other town. Yes. So it's possible that some town would say no, and then there'd be a smaller number of towns paying a larger amount of money, or maybe it would be less. Maybe it wouldn't be a large amount of money because she wouldn't have as big a job. Is all that worked out? Um, well, the way that it's worked out so far is, is that, the five of us that represented the five conservation commissions agreed that we had to go to our respective town boards, a select board and finance committee and say, we're looking for a three year commitment because we're not gonna really get a good sense of how well this is working out until we have some time that passes. And so yeah. presumably all five towns have gotten a commitment from their finance committees and their select boards to fund this position. The first year is taken care of. They'll have to fund the next two years after that. But there's an expectation that, you know, this will continue and would as long as it's it's working well. Uh, there were other towns that had considered joining. Uh, Goshen apparently was one of the towns, but the select board was supportive. But the Conservation Commission said no, and I have no idea why. Uh, Conway was considering it, and then they chose to opt out at one point. Uh, so the five towns that remain in it is the uh, is Williamsburg is the biggest town with 2,400 people. And then there's Waitley, Ashfield, Buckland, and Hawley. Hawley being the smallest of the towns. Uh, and so the representatives from all five commissions were involved in the interviews, have been involved in meetings about the, the cooperative agreement that was signed, signed by all of the five towns. So I have a good feel for about this you know everybody seems to be willing to be flexible understanding that you know our workloads shift from month to month or year to year some towns like last year was a super busy year for conway because of all the flooding and all the road washouts so some years you're going to have really busy years and the agent's going to have to spend more time in that town the thought is, is that over three years or even longer, it'll all come out in the wash and everybody will get what they need. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, so um, I sent you a bunch of, I forwarded, as you could tell, I finally got around to checking my email and sending out forwarding stuff to you. Uh, the pollinator focused habitat project kickoff event um, I can't remember what date that is, but I just want to make sure that you knew about it and that you, when you felt welcome to go attend it, I don't know if I will make it or not, but, you know, it's nice to have a project like that in town. I don't know if it needs our, uh, personal involvement, but if, it, if any of you would like to go, I think that I'm would be a good thing. Go. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. You got your, you can get your speech already so that, yeah. <laughs> be like the Gettysburg Address of Waitley. Um, another thing that came up is um, there's apparently somebody that's planning to lease the White Birch Campground uh, and then, I guess, run it for the next year with the possibility of purchasing it or continuing to lease it and maybe even expanding it. Um, and so um, yeah, this is something that is news to me. I don't know if any other of you uh, knew about this, um, but uh, Deb from the Zoning Board of Appeals sort of CC'd me in on this just so that I was aware of it. I just asked if she wouldn't mind just to mention to the person that's leasing that there's a lot of wetlands there and any kind of expansion are probably going to need our review and approval. 
Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. And if you know of anything or heard of anything that, that would be useful for the rest of us to know, feel free to, to chime in. I do know that that message was conveyed. Okay. What a shock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you know anything more about it that would be of interest or no, that you're no, free to say? Her, the woman told her she has a, a couple of busy weeks running her food truck and uh, hasn't even mm. looked at things yet. And uh, okay. she understands that uh, Conservation Commission and uh, Planning Board will likely be involved. Mm. Uh, and then the last one on the updates list was the FERCOG survey of watershed projects. Um, you know, I, I forwarded that. If any of you have ideas for FERCOG, you can contact them directly. I don't think you need to go through as of an official Conservation Commission uh, process. But it sounded to me as I read through it that it seemed to be focused on um, impaired waters. And so these are water bodies and waterways that don't meet the water quality standards for those water bodies. And I don't know if Waitley has any water bodies that don't meet water quality standards. So I don't know if there are any good projects to propose, but if you think of any, uh, feel free to contact uh, uh, Tamsin and, 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 you know, put it out there for her. All right. Um, anybody have any other business? Um, future business, I think, um, I mm. got a CPA project for next year. They're thinking of putting a dock in it at, um, Tritown beach. So it's going to be on near that wetland edge. So I don't know if that to come before us. Yeah, it'll come before us. And, um, I did get an email from the person that's sort of heading that up. Um, Ken Cuddlebeck. Yeah. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, that he had been busy, wasn't able to really get to this right away, but now he's working on it. He sort of drafted, I think, a determination of applicability and, and sent it to me and asked me to look at it and, and, and give him some feedback. So I only got that a day or so ago, um, or I got it on Sunday over the weekend. Uh, so I expect this will come to us, but... Um, you know, I don't know quite what the timing is. I'll have to look. I, yeah, really looking, I think they're looking for next year's funding. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. something in the future. I'm, I'm sort of wondering why they did an RDA. Didn't we all go out there and, and, and look at it? I know I went out there at one point. That was for the... That was for the, the invasives. The invasives, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I don't know if, if I ever said an RDA would be appropriate, but if they're putting a dock in the water... Mm -hmm. I expect that would require an, a notice of intent, but uh, I'll take a look at it and see if it's just a repair. No, this and, is a brand new dock. A brand new dock, yeah. No, that's going to require an NOI. So, so that's I'll the feedback they need. Yeah. Yeah, get a consultant. Um, yeah, okay. Um, any other business? No. All right, I got an email from um, Todd Clark. I had sent him the agendas in case they wanted to join. He writes, thank you for letting us know as coordinated as, as coordinated, we ask to defer, some kind of typo. We ask to defer to November in order to afford the time necessary to continue addressing comments received. Okay, pretty much what I already said. <laughs> All right, well, we can go back to the, the bylaw now. Uh, so, Brent, I don't know if you want to share screen. Yeah, yeah. Do I have permission to share screen? Uh, you will have in a minute. Um, Maybe what I'll do while you're setting me up for that, um, I'm going to drop something into the chat. Um, all right, I... you should be all set. Okay, great. So... I'm dropping in a PDF of a of a flood map, flood zone map that because I'm going to share it on my screen, but may just not uh, be as visible if you want to look at it locally. I don't see it yet, Brent. Okay. I wonder if it's too big. Uh, let's see. So I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Um. 
does seem like I have. I mean, there wouldn't. It may take a while. It is like a thirty-two megabyte file, so it may take a little bit to you know migrate its way. But I just wanted you guys to see. Right now, um, I, Scott did a, a great job of sort of summarizing the situation. Uh, the, the state of Massachusetts is requiring all of its communities to update their flood zone bylaws following a new state model. Uh, and if and we have a deadline, um, which effectively is we have to get this before voters at our next annual town meeting. So whether that's April, May, June, next year, that's kind of our deadline to have a final zoning bylaw um, that updates our floodplain protections following the, the new state model. Uh, and if we don't do this, then we lose access to the National Flood Insurance Program. And there's some, there's some other things that we wouldn't want to have happen, right? So there's a little bit of a, there's some strong reason that we need to do this. What you're looking at is the late 1970s era FEMA maps. So the flood zones, the regulated flood zones are determined by, by FEMA. They are in the process of updating and digitizing this data. Uh, they don't yet have final uh, a new FEMA map yet. There are some drafts available, but they're not, I don't know that they're gonna be final even before our annual town meeting next year, but they're coming along. And there's right now they're not even available in a digital form. They're only available in paper form. But I just wanted you to get a sense by looking at this, the blue areas, you know, like along the edge of the you know, Connecticut River, um, you know, kind of along the you know the brook and up into West Waitley around the reservoir. Those are those little blue, sort of dark bluish, purplish patches are the FEMA defined regulated floodways. And so the zoning bylaw sets requirements on what kind of development is permitted within those areas and what the oversight and review process is for such development, all right? We actually have in our current zoning bylaws, I don't necessarily recommend that you go but if you're curious, you can find that we have some existing regulation going back quite a while um, for an out-of-date flood overlay protection bylaw. All right? And what we need to do is entirely replace that with this new state model. All right? So I'm going to stop sharing the map with the hope. And basically, I think the point that I want to make is that there are certainly areas in Waitley that where this is going to apply to, but it's not necessarily a lot. And you know, I think that the general consensus is that people typically don't, they know about this and they don't do development in these areas to begin with. Um, it's, it is sort of interesting given the point about um, the campground that they have some wet uh, some of this regulated floodway in their property if you sort of look closely up out there on north road but anyway so let me stop sharing this map since and if anyone wants their own copy of this if they can't get it through the chat just let me know so what i want to do next is share a draft of this current zoning bylaw, Waitley's version of the zoning bylaw, and just give you a little bit of the history. So again, there's a state model that, that think of the state model as a template. And we've been doing this, we started this at least two years ago. And we worked with a senior planner at FERCOG, and went back and forth, back and forth, and took the state model and tweaked and tailored it to fit what we all thought were the um, you know, the particular needs and concerns of Waitley while still adhering to the key requirements of the state model. So what you're going to, what I'm going to just 
whiz you over. And again, I can share this draft, circulate it if anyone wants to see it. But basically think of this draft as something that started with a state template and got refined. And we got to a point maybe about a year ago on the planning board where we thought this was near final. There were really only a couple of sticking points at the time. One was this new bylaw. And again, I can, if people want to see this, um, can circulate it. But there was a key part where the bylaw and the state model requires every community to designate a staff person as the floodplain administrator. All right? We didn't have such a, a position in the old way we regulated development in, in the floodplain. Um, and there was some back and forth, back and forth about who that would be with Brian, the previous town administrator. And we kind of ended up agreeing that the uh, community development administrator, which was then in the process being hired, would be the floodplain administrator. So we kind of resolved that particular issue. Uh, and we got all the other language in this bylaw, um, kind of, we were pretty happy with it, but there was this part G, and you're not seeing the original part G, um, but there was a part G review by the Conservation Commission. And going back about a year ago, we had a version of the language, not what you're seeing here on your screen, but a version that more or less said the Conservation Commission is going to have to do approval, whatever that meant. And that was kind of where we got sidetracked because what that meant, how that would be done. Um, how, at that time, we just hired Sylvie Jensen as the new community development, admi community development administrator. So the planning board kind of tabled this whole thing, put it over into Sylvie's court since she was going to be the floodplain administrator under this bylaw. And, and, the, and the clock wasn't ticking particularly fast on us to get this done at the time. So we kind of said, Sylvie, why don't you like work with the Conservation Commission, help, help resolve this. And it never quite got resolved. So, but now we really have to get this done by town meeting in 2025. So um, Pete, um, Pete Kane and Scott and I, had a sort of meeting and discussion about it. And what you're seeing here is language. Oh, and I will point out that the state model doesn't actually require any review or approval by the Conservation Commission. Right? So we're not, in terms of what the state is requiring to appear in this bylaw to be compliant with the state and keep us eligible for the National Flood Insurance Program. State doesn't say we have to do anything like this. It was the consensus between, you know, the planning board, you know, a year plus ago and FERCOG, that given the special expertise of the Conservation Commission, having the CONCOM have some role in, you know, reviewing and or approving whatever we sort of say, it seemed like, you guys would have some special expertise about things in floodplains. So we, anyway, so we had some language, wasn't really satisfactory. And then as at the top of today's meeting, Scott proposed the language that you're seeing here. All right. So, um, and I think you sort of basically get the idea. If, if you want us to read it, I need a I need a, a minute of silence. Okay.
Let me know when you're good. I'm all set. Okay. So this moved in the, at least my opinion, negotiating on behalf of the planning board, this moved the conversation usefully forward. Um, this paragraph basically sets up the conservation commission and, and, I, and I, I think properly so as an advisor to the floodplain administrator because it basically includes language that says the commission will issue an opinion to the floodplain administrator. I think that's a key point and the, and the right role. So it's not like the conservation commission is a, a gatekeeper, a go, no go decider. In this version of the, the write up, the conservation commission provides an opinion, gives it to the floodplain administrator and it's the floodplain administrator who makes the final determination, which is also captured in the um, in this draft language, a determination shall be made by the floodplain administrator. And then there is this other language that Scott had proposed that we're not necessarily, you know, we're thinking that that particular language isn't, necess isn't really necessary in a zoning bylaw. And there are some other things that we thought might need to go into this language. So we came back with a counter proposal, which I'm going to show you, which is, so let me do a new share. So I have to stop the share. So now I'm going to share this count, this new proposed language. Okay. So I'm going to say that all of this is from Scott's original proposal to the to us. So this is unchanged. All right. So what's new text? So note that they're basically saying that any new construction or changes have to be reviewed by the Conservation Commission. So we're just talking about review versus approval. So this is the new language I want us to talk about see how you all feel about that. Let me sort of explain it. So we kept the same, kept the idea that the commission issues an opinion to the floodplain administrator. And what we did is we changed, we clarified what the nature of that opinion is. So the opinion is as to whether the project is proposed is likely to increase the risk of flooding due to changes in land use, including but not limited to grading, paving, drilling, and excavating. Right. At its discretion, you may the commission may suggest conditions which could mitigate identified risks. I know it's challenging you a little bit to remember the original language and we can sort of flip back and forth. But it, the original write-up, I probably should put these side by side. Let me see if I can. Let's see if I can do this in a way where you can see. The easiest might be to paste them both onto a, a new document and show that. Yeah, um, that would take me a little bit more time. Okay. <laughs> All right, but I think I think this is this is below the window below is Scott's original language, and I've highlighted. I'm only seeing one window. Oh, stop. Sorry about that. Share. 
what I'm going to do is, I think if I share my screen, you'll now be able to see the whole thing. Okay. How is, are you seeing the two word windows now? Yes. Okay. So here below is Scott's sentence. The commission will issue an opinion as to whether the project is proposed or if conducted under specific conditions, complies with the floodplain bylaw. So it didn't seem like the Conservation Commission should be making offering opinions about compliance with the bylaw. So this is why we su suggested instead that you issue an opinion about the likelihood of increased risk of flooding. Second, the original, Scott's original language added in this piece about specific conditions. All we've done is kind of split those ideas out into two sentences. All right, that's the at its discretion. So there's no obligation for the CONCOM to propose any mitigations. But the scope of the commission's requirements or review is about what is your opinion that this project is likely to increase the risk of flooding? All right. And then it's we clarify that it's the floodplain administrator that considers. the commission's opinion and any suggested conditions when determining whether the proposed project complies with the floodplain overlay district bylaw. And then the last piece of the proposed language is to put some reasonable time limit on the conservation commission's ability or time limit on furnishing this opinion. And so we proposed that the, com the commission shall have 45 days from the date of the floodplain administrator's request for review to complete its review and provide its opinion. If no response is received within 45 days, the commission shall be considered to have no opinion within its area of expertise on the proposed project. All right. So I want to get your feedback on the this these three pieces. First, the, the language clarifying what kind of opinion we're trying to get from the Conservation Commission. That's number one. Number two, there's this bit about your discretionary ability to suggest conditions. Number and then really number three is the 45-day time limit. All right, so I'm going to leave this up. Can't see anybody at the moment, but I'll open the floor to comments and questions, or defer to Scott to do to moderate. Uh, just throwing this out as a hypothetical: if this becomes before us, this will probably be at a meeting. Do we want to extend it to like a 60 day instead of a 45? I'm trying to think if we have to have time to review the project site visits and maybe have it at our next meeting. Is that 45 days enough time? And I was thinking about that too. And we also would need to make sure there's time to post it on the agenda. Yeah. So there's a little math involved. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to extend it to, I picked 45 days because elsewhere in our zoning bylaws, there are similar kinds of time limits. Mm -hmm. Um, just so there is due process and we can't hold things up. But if, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I was thinking month to month because if we have to have it at one meeting and we have to defer it or it has to go to a second meeting or if it extends, you might need that longer time period. I don't know. I'm happy to go with 60 days if that's the consensus mm -hmm. of this group. The other, the, the other parts seem fine to me. It's just that one last part. So. Yeah, I agree. The first two parts are fine with me. All right, Scott, do you want to weigh in or, I mean, what, I, what I'm what i happy to yeah. do is 
pencil in 60 days because this is going to come up at the planning board's meeting on October 30th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that'd be another point because if it's the planning board's to co try to coordinate two committees too, that might differ, you know, having that time period. Yeah, the planning board is not involved in the um, enforcement or execution of the floodplain bylaw, right? So the idea is the project gets proposed, um, it would be proposed through some application to the floodplain administrator per the bylaw. And the floodplain administrator plays the administrative role of coordinating with the various entities such as the Conservation Commission to make sure that they do what is needed for them to do per the bylaw. I'm just guessing they'd have to go to a public forum like this to one of our meetings just to present it. Yeah, I think that would be the case. Yeah, I think the I think this is a <clears throat> an important concern, and it, it may even be that sixty days may be problematic in some cases. In the majority of instances, when somebody might want to work in a floodplain, it's going to fall under the jurisdiction of the Wetlands Protection Act as well. And so, if in the process of us reviewing the project, it requires continuations while they redesign their project. That might, it's hard for us to know how long it will take an applicant to come back with plans that are acceptable under the Wetlands Protection Act. So we might not in be in a position to make an opinion until our public hearing process is over. And, you know, we have, you know, yeah, we have jurisdiction over most things. The things that we wouldn't have jurisdiction over is farm buildings and maintenance of existing utilities, bridge repair projects, uh, things that are done under an emergency declaration, things like that. And so those are the situations where, you know, we might make a recommendation, but an applicant might want to make sure that our recommendation is what they want to hear. So they might say, well, what do we have to do in order to get you to, to say that this is okay? And then we're again waiting for them to uh, to come back with plans that we feel are adequate. So I I think what you're trying to do is important. It's just that um, it may be one of those things where if the applicant requests an extension of that timeline, then you can do that. And that way, an applicant that wants our approval isn't bound by that 60 day thing where suddenly after, as we get close to 60 days or 45 days, we're like, all right, well, we got to say something. Right. So right. based on what we see right now, we're going to say no, disapproved. Right. <laughs> could we, could the language change and just say something like, um, we'll have X number, the conservation commission will have X number of days to begin the review process. Yeah. Let me, let me take this all as good feedback and even, and talk to Pete, uh, Pete Kane too, because it could be that we just fix this. Right? Like I think you all get the intent. We don't mm -hmm. want to that that residents don't want to have their projects held up because like just you know government is not being responsive. But I think mm -hmm. there can and should be a mechanism for there to be like. 45 days for the concert or 60 days for the conservation commission, at least say something mm -hmm. and potentially ask for an extension. We're just trying to guard that if there's no answer at all, not even like we're looking into it, mm -hmm. then there, the, we're trying to protect the rights of the, of the property mm -hmm. owner to not be unnecessarily blocked sort of ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. So let me see if we can um, rework that time, that bit to make sure that um, we don't just, we don't put unreasonable timelines on and we allow for appropriate extensions. But it sounds like in terms of all the other pieces of this and in particular that this group feels that if, a project in one of these regulated floodplains were to be presented to the commission for review, 
you would have the expertise collectively to evaluate whether that project, you know, grading or putting in a building or doing whatever they're going to do um, is going to, is likely to increase the risk of flooding. That's kind of a question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is stuff we're charged with reviewing anyway. And even those things that are exempt from us are not really all that different from the things that are not exempt. The Those that are not exempt from us, we also have provisions for if it's a complicated project that we feel like we don't have the expertise to review, we can use uh, our Section 53G authorization to require them to pay for a third party to do the review for us. Um, and, you know, if it's something we have jurisdiction over, nobody's going to want to go forward until they gotten through our process anyway. So I think we have, you know, some experience with this kind of stuff. We have the capacity to get additional expertise if it's required. Uh, so I think, you know, I think the whole question was, you know, who else in town would have the kind of background experience to to, to make these judgments and, and there probably isn't anybody. I mean, there may be individuals on boards, but as a board, you would expect the Conservation Commission to have the most experience with these kinds of things. Okay. okay. Well, then I feel like for me, it's mission accomplished. I'll get yeah. back to uh, Scott with propo proposed revisions to this paragraph. And unless there are other questions for me, I'm happy to sign off for the night. Yeah, I, I'm I'm con I'm uh, happy with what you've done with it. I think it's consistent with what I was trying to do with my language, and it's just massaging it a little bit to be consistent. Uh, so, uh, you know, I agree that this question of how to deal with delays when somebody's going to redesign their project is probably the only one you know, that that would concern me as well. So, um, yeah, it's a good conversation, good opportunity to have everybody's input on this. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to come to our meeting and and engage in this conversation. Great. Well, it was um, time well spent. So thank mm -hmm. you all. Appreciate having the opportunity. All right. Good night, all. All right. Good night, Brent. All right. All right. I think we may be finished. Uh, anybody have anything else? Any other business or questions no, or comments? No mail this week, this month? We, not, we don't get paper mail hardly at all anymore. <laughs> we do get email stuff, and I try to forward the things that seem relevant to you. So it's actually more efficient than actually opening an envelope and, and then passing it around a meeting or or reading it out loud. But, uh, I yeah, should, no, me, I no mail. Shot. You had said a cutting plan. You said Hayden Hill Road, or was it? Westbrook Road. I wasn't certain looking at the plan. Remember, you sent a cutting plan. It said Haydenville for Haydenville Road. George, you're you're muted, George. <laughs> yep. Okay. It, it's Flora and and uh, Richard Chamlin's property there between Haydenville and Westbrook. Okay. Um, I I had seen there was a, a microburst in that July storm. They took so many trees out, and I I had noticed um. On the other side of Westbrook, a lot of trees down, but apparently up up at the high point in their property, uh, also there there was a lot of blowdown, and they're doing a salvage okay, so logging up there. It's, yeah, uh, I was confused looking at it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Thanks, George. So, yep. All right. Well, I thought we might have a shorter meeting than this, but actually I think it was time well spent to talk about that floodplain stuff. Um, we really were spinning our wheels for the longest time and now it looks like we're getting some traction again. Uh, but you know, originally they wanted the Conservation Commission to be making the decisions and then I would have questions about, well, you gonna ask us to write regulations for your bylaw and, and, and then we enforce it and we issue the permits and, you know, do we need to create our own forms and like, how's this going to work? Um, and then, um, you know, the new uh, town administrator, uh, Peter, basically said, you know, it's not appropriate to have a board be in this case, there needs to be a person, a floodplain manager designated. 
and boards turn over. So you can't really do that effectively if you try to have a board in that role. It turns out managers turn over quicker than boards do, though. Yeah, it, it and, turns out, yeah. And community development administrators, because Sophie has left, right? Sylvia. And what? Yeah. Yeah, oh, Sylvia has left now, too? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the idea was to make it, I think actually this was back to when Brian was around. He said, okay, we'll make it the town administrator or their or his designee oh. uh, or her designee. In this case, it was a his. But And then they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll make it the community development person. And, you know, that'll be his designee. And then Peter said, no, it should be whoever enforces zoning in general should be enforcing this zoning bylaw as well. It wouldn't make sense to have somebody else so there was going to be some discussion of whether that was appropriate and uh i think pete looked at a bunch of other towns to see who who is the uh, enforcement agent for theirs or the the floodplain it's it's variable from town to town yeah. so yeah. i don't know what they're going to end up in the in this draft one i haven't read it through yet to find out what what they're put in there but you know, I, I have raised the issue that you know people have questions about the building inspection office actually whether they have whether they do enforcement adequately or not, hmm. and that would they have the knowledge or expertise to really judge, you know, work within a floodplain, mm -hmm. and so that's why people said, well, we we should keep the conservation commission in the loop on this stuff because yeah, you wouldn't expect building inspectors to always know, you know what's acceptable or what's not acceptable. So anyway, we're making progress on it. And, uh, you know, we this is something we have to do. And I don't think it's going to make a lot of extra work for us because most of, you know, the things on the list are things that would come to us anyway under the Wetlands Protection Act. And, right. and the fact that we don't get those projects means that people are staying out of the floodplain generally anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the areas I was most concerned about was agriculture. <clears throat> this would be a way for us to to review agricultural projects under mm -hmm. the bylaw but as it turns out <clears throat> there's this weird thing where in general ag projects are exempt as long as there is no loss of flood storage capacity so no significant amount of fill in the floodplain but then later it talks about buildings that you can have a building up to four thousand square feet uh and then it says uh, that that's acceptable in a floodplain as long as, you know, there's no fill outside of the footprint of the building. So that seemed a little weird to me that, you know, how could somebody don't should... you need fill out <clears throat> if like if a building is on fill, there's going to need to be fill outside of the building as well. Well, I think the uh, they could just put it on a slab on the ground. But the thing is, is that once the building gets built, it's now occupying some of that floodplain. It won't store water there anymore. You do have the loss of flood storage capacity, even if there's no fill that it's placed on. Yeah, uh, so. so they're willing to accept that. And there was actually an example from Eastern Mass where somebody was um, wanted to put in a solar array, uh, you know, a commercial solar array in a wetland area uh, or in an area subject to jurisdiction or, you know, could have been riverfront. I'm not sure. And they, the, the Conservation Commission shot it down, you know, because there was going to be all of this infrastructure in resource areas. So then they came back with a proposal to erect a whole series of greenhouses that were all going to be 3,900 square feet and they were covered with solar panels. <laughs> and so the idea was, okay, but the, the question came up is like, okay, but is this exemption for one farm structure or can you put as many farm structures as you want? And it was really unresolved. And I think some, it was eventually concluded that, yeah, probably you can put multiple farm structures as long as each one is under 4,000 square feet. And so there, there's still a lot of gray area in the regulations. And, and, and uh, I can just imagine somebody coming in and proposing, you know, like a hundred greenhouses in a, floodplain all of which are just under the size necessary and you know under the wetlands protection act we would have no jurisdiction under that but under this bylaw we would then now have some say in it uh, going forward so in some ways it might be a nice little backfilling of some of those loopholes that you know every now and then get unearthed 
All right, I think we're fit we're through for today. Um, we'll probably see the Haydenville Road project come back to us in November, <clears throat> and then we'll see what else comes on to the docket between now and then. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.